I haven't uploaded in a while, so I decided that halfway through the season, about 37 games in, I believe, coming off of a loss to Pittsburgh last night, I thought it was a good idea to put together a tier list of this year's Boston Bruins roster based on expectations. Because if we had anything to look forward to this year, it's players stepping up into bigger roles. And sitting near the top of the standings, it's safe to say that a few players did that. So I'm just going to start right away. Um, I'm only including players that have played at least 10 games. So Merkulov and Boakfist are notable omissions from this list, as well as Milan Lucic, who, even if he had played 10 games, would not be deserving of being put in this video. I'll start with Parker Watherspoon. Um, so he came in from the Islanders and spent a lot of last year with Bridgeport, and essentially the expectations that I had for him were that, were that he would be a seventh defender for this team, as he was that for the Islanders at points last season, and he did pretty well in that role. But so far, I could say he's moderately exceeding expectations, because anytime he's been put in the lineup, he hasn't looked overly out of place, like he's had himself some pretty strong games here and there, and he's been oddly commanding in the offensive zone, not exactly with how he moves the puck, but just how he maintains possession for the Bruins, and he's really helping us control play as long as he's playing in a sheltered role. So I would say he's moderately exceeding expectations because I didn't expect much more than just a guy who comes into the lineup every now and then and just survives. But he's done more than that. When he gets in the lineup, he he thrives in a way, you know, relative to expectations for him. So I've been pretty happy with him. He's been a he's been our sixth defender for a lot of this season. So I really can't complain. Um, Johnny Beecher. So he came from Providence, 2019 first round pick, late first round, right after we lost in the uh, Stanley Cup final, and he took a while to develop. It's his first year in the NHL this year, and he's played the vast majority of games. Um, I don't even think he's missed any games. Only a couple. I think he's been scratched for two games this season, as he's got 35. And he's only got four goals and two assists, but I think his defensive game has been a lot better than his offensive game. He's a weirdly good shooter. He'll randomly walk to the slot or even to the uh, to the top of the circle and just rifle one past the goaltender, catching him off guard. I think having a fourth liner with his kind of speed is always a good thing. And I'd say he's meeting expectations because he's not really taking himself... He's not really taking a step to where he could be a third-line center or anything. He's playing as a fourth liner, and he, I think he's playing it well enough. Next up is Charlie Coyle, who had... All the expectations in the world coming into this season, not based off previous years, but essentially the Bruins needed him to be our guy because the Bruins didn't go out and make any significant moves in the offseason to get a center. Our biggest ad up the middle was Morgan Geeky, who's, you know, we'll get to Geeky, we'll get to him. But for Coyle, the hope was that he could finally take this step and for as talented as he is, he just never... It seemed like he always lacked this this edge or this. He he is a he's such an incredible skater and and a puck handler, but he just never knew how to get get it to the net or create a scoring chance out of what he does. So the hope is that he could finally do that. And when he started the season, he was doing that. He was absolutely doing that. And I would have put him at highly exceeding expectations or at least moderately. But since then. He's kind of trailed off. He's producing well, but I don't exactly think he's playing out of his mind. If you really if you watch him out there, he doesn't look like he's like he just looks like the same Charlie Coyle over the last 10 games or so. And because of how he started the season, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and put him in moderately exceeding expectations, but honestly, like Coyle is such a polarizing player because of how well he, he like he looks so it's like such a talented player out there, but he can never get it to the net. And this season, he finally started doing that, but he has tapered off. So the most I can give him is that he's moderately exceeding expectations. I would even put him in between these if I could. But for now, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I like Coyle. 
I hope he can pick it back up and start playing like he was playing to start the year, where he was hovering around a point per game, which was some of the best play he's ever played in his career. Next up is Trent Frederick, who I've always found to be one of Boston's most reliable players in terms of how well the Bruins have been developing him. It just seems like you could always count on him to improve year after year. And I think the same could probably be said for this year. He's got 10 goals in 37 games. He's on, he's got he's playing at a 20 goal pace right now. And I think that's all we can really ask for him. I think he's I would say he's moderately exceeding, but again, he's kind of like Coyle in the sense that I would put him in between. I like it's kind of where I expected Frederick to go. I thought he would take this next step and he has, but you know, like even then, I, I wouldn't have penned in Freddie as a 20-goal player. You know, like, he it seems like he has that kind of scoring touch now, but wouldn't have wouldn't have expected that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put him in moderately exceeding expectations, although I would put him in between if I could. Next up is Jakob Lauko, and as much as I love Lauko for that fire and energy he brings and how much he seems like out of all the players on the team he loves this sport more than anyone else but with that said he hasn't really taken a step in terms of his actual on ice play he brings the energy that he brought last year but i just don't think he's taking a step to improve his actual game like the on ice product is still the same he's he's essentially getting outplayed this season by Oscar Steen which is unfortunate because He's got that speed. I don't. He doesn't really have the hands, but he's got the speed and he's got the energy to be a truly dominant fourth liner if he just puts it all together. But I think that the fact that he didn't take a step, really, in my opinion, I think it warrants putting him in moderately falling short of expectations. As much as I would like him to get to those expectations, I was hoping for a little more out of him. I'm glad he's getting those games. He's got 27 games this year. He still hasn't scored a goal. He's got three points. But even without producing, he's not hes not as defensively sound. He's more frantic out there. It feels like the Bruins are at more of a risk for chances to be created from the opposite team when he's out there. Next is Matt Potra, who's... Still not back with the team. I believe he's back skating with the team, but he just returned from the World Juniors. He had four points in five games. That's unrelated to this, but just thought I'd mention. Where it really matters, the NHL. Patra, he's been exceeding expectations. I can't say highly because, you know, 13 points in 27 games for a uh, non-first-round pick. I believe he was a second-round pick from Boston. He's, um, he's... He's playing incredibly well, considering where he was picked and how young he still is. He's only 19 right now, and um, he he's he's playing like an NHL player, which is great. I don't think he's playing at like much more than a third line center at the moment, but that's all we need from him right now. Just center depth and some youth, and I hope Montgomery can figure it out and start playing this guy more often. I heard there was plans to move him to the wing once he gets back. I think that is a terrible idea. I think he's much much more suited as a center. I know he likes playing along the wall and he's really really shifty along the boards, but you can still run the, that kind of that kind of movement as a center. I don't think I don't think he couldn't thrive on the wing, but I don't know. I'd rather they just keep him at center and like let him develop his play up the middle. That's what we need. Side tangent aside, um He's been he's been exceeding expectations. He, he all that's all he's been doing since he showed up to training camp is he was immediately the best player in training camp and then in the preseason he was a clear standout and he fought to make the team and he did it against all odds. That's exceeding expectations right there. And then as soon as preseason ended, the expectation was he could be our third line center and he's done that so you could almost say meeting expectations, but at the same time, defying the expectations for him in preseason was hard enough. Next is Pavel Zaka, and to be honest, I think it's a clear, I think it's clear to put him in meeting expectations. At least for me, there were a lot of people who were expecting Zaka to step it up and be a legitimate top six center. For one, top six center, this guy he's not. 
he's not even that's not even his best position. He's much better suited on the wing. He always has been. So when we put him at center, I think my expectations and everyone else's should drop. Like he's clearly a better player on the wing. Why are we expecting this guy to be a top six center for the Boston Bruins? Like this is a team at the top of the standings. We can't really expect this guy to to dominate in that kind of role. Not just dominate, but to to excel in that role. I've had a lot of things to say about Pavel Zaka this season. I think he's far from a top six center. Not that he couldn't be a top six player, though. I think he could be a complimentary winger in the top six, like he was last year for most of the season, next to Krejci and Pasternak. I think that was where he played best. And now that he's in this bigger role, I really don't love his game. He, he's, his, he's, he's somewhat intelligent, but... His puck skills are just not there. And that's what you need when you're playing with a guy like Pasternak. And his scoring touch is still hit or miss for me. And he's not that he's not that stellar of a playmaker. He's just average in a lot of areas. And his puck management is not good. It's not good. And when you play with a guy like Pasternak, you kind of need it to be good because Pasternak is a very high-risk player, and if you can't be some kind of safeguard for him, what are you doing alongside of him? I think Zaka works best with Pasternak, but probably on the wing, like they've been running lately, where they've been doing Zaka on on the left side and then Geeky up the middle and Pasternak on the wing. I think that's where he looks best, but for now, he's meeting my expectations of him. Because I didn't expect him to be much more than a fringe 2C that could probably be a fine top 6 left winger. Just nowhere near the best player on his line. Next up, I have Oscar Steen. And to be honest, I'll say he's meeting expectations as much as I've been a little bit disappointed with a lack of a step in his game. I was really hoping for that. But I wasn't expecting it, you know. I was just hoping that he could surprise me, because Steen is a—he's a very one-dimensional player, and right now he's kind of just been glued to that fourth line. And if he's going to be anywhere in this lineup, that's where he should be. I've been advocating to take him out because I don't think he brings the speed that Lauko brings or the youth that and 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 the speed that Beecher brings. So. I think taking him out for a guy like Merkulov could be an interesting look because that fourth line provides no offense. And I'm tired of fourth lines that just kill the clock. It's not, it's never going to be beneficial to the team. And, you know, so because of this, it's like an unfair treatment towards Steen for me to say this, right? Because, you know, he's, because he's a better player than Lauko, but Lauko brings something that Steen doesn't, and that's energy. And... Because of this, Steen has kind of been relegated to the third guy on that line, and I think that he's really going to need to bring more offense for me to be convinced that he should stay on that line full-time. But he's a he's an NHL player in, in his own right. He's a good defensive player. He doesn't hinder our team so much as he just makes it, you know, he kind of stops it from being what it could be, in a, in a way. Just the fourth line. Steen's not the... He's not the the killer of the Boston Bruins. Don't get don't get me wrong. Jake DeBrusque. He has been on a heater lately. I believe he's up to seven points in his last five games, maybe eight points. I believe it's seven and five. But he did have a pretty weak start to the season. I thought he was playing moderately well, but you could tell that his frustrations were getting to him, which is not a rare occurrence for Jake DeBrusque. It's happened so many times throughout his career. He just goes on these long, long, long streaks without scoring or without recording a point even. And lately, he's been picking it back up. But I will still say overall that he is falling short. Because last season, playing with Bergeron and Marchand, he looked like a legitimate top six two-way winger. He played on the power play, the penalty kill. This guy, he was, he's a Swiss army knife once he's going. Not not the most um, not the most stellar playmaker, but he did have a good tendency to get to the net, and you know he, while still being somewhat complacent, he knew when to cut towards goal, and that's why he played so well last season, and that's why he was a huge part of why that team was so good, especially with his play on the penalty kill, and it's all still been there, but his 
two-way play at five on five hasn't been as strong and clearly his finishing touch disappeared for a while this season hopefully it's coming back and hopefully it's here to stay because DeBrusque is an extremely talented player when he's on but when he's off he's very frustrating to watch Brad Marchand this is a tough one because Marchand's expectations coming into the year without Bergeron should have still been high but a lot lower Bergeron and Marchand as good as Marchand is they make each other so much better and I think without Bergeron, Marshawn is still an elite playmaker and has some of the most dog I've ever seen from a player in Boston Bruins history. But this year, he's really taken a step back in terms of play driving and, and two-way dominance. So I'm, I'm very confident in putting him in, in falling short, despite the high production. He's still playing at around a 75-point pace, which is nothing to scoff at. He's playing, he's producing well still, but... The problem is his his shift to shift dominance is not there like it has been in the past, and that's something that you can't just ignore with with a player of his caliber. He's still been one of our top players this season because of you know the role he's playing in and the difficulty of that role, but he's really not excelling in that role right now, and that's something that I can see picking up because he's still endlessly talented, but. I wouldn't say he's meeting my expectations of him, even without Bergeron. Production's one thing, but actual on-ice effectiveness is another. James Van Riemsdyk. This might be the first to go into highly exceeding expectations. He's still being he's still being sheltered a good amount, and if there's one thing about Montgomery that I really like, he's very good at sheltering players when they need to be sheltered. And by that, I mean giving them matchups that are fair to their ability. Not try, not overplaying someone to the point where they're gonna get dominated out there too frequently. You're putting he's putting players in the in a position to succeed, and that is an overused term when it comes to coaching. But I really think Montgomery is one of the best in the league at that, and he's done wonders for Van Riemsdyk's play. He's been he's not been sheltered too much to where he can't you know have a challenge every now and then. But it's obvious that Van Van Riemsdyk is not a terrific skater anymore. He's not a terrific puck handler. But if there's anything he's good at, it's these cross seam passes. And his overall playmaking ability is still great. He's a very smart player still, and he's being put in a really good position to, to succeed this year. Only seven goals this year, but he's got 25 points in 35 games. 18 assists. He's on pace for for about 40 assists this season. That is nothing to scoff at. Those are very, very good assist numbers, and that was pretty much expected. James Van Riemsdyk, over the past couple years now, ever since he left Toronto, essentially, has been more of a playmaker than a goal scorer. And I think he's embraced that role really well. I think Montgomery's helped him out. And he has been such a big help for this lineup. Anywhere he plays, that line plays well. He's been the most consistently supportive player on this team. And he's he's highly exceeding my expectations. I thought we would stuff him on that third line and he'd be just all right there. But he's been a complete Swiss Army knife. He's been exactly what Jake DeBrusque has needed to be. I I love Van Riemsdyk's play this year. And I hope he keeps it up. Uh, David Pasternak. So Pasternak is far and away leading the Bruins in points, goals, and even assists. He's got 53 points in 37 games, 23 goals. This is about expected of him. He's such a talented player. If there's one thing about Pasternak, though, he is such a high-risk player. He's a giveaway machine, and he's definitely not... He's definitely not a monster along the boards. I love his edge that he's played with this year, but he has had his off nights. And it's a little disappointing when that happens because when he's on, he produces like a madman. He he gets four points one night, and then the next three games, he gets no points. He's a very weird player like that. There's only a few few top-of-the-line players that just do that, that just can be on or completely off, like, in a game-to-game, on a game-to-game basis. But he's one of those guys. And because of that, I'd say he's moderately... He's either meeting... No, he's meeting expectations. Because we know Pasternak is one of the best wingers in the league. He's doing pretty much exactly what he has been doing over the past few years. He's leading the way in production. He's been a massive help to this team. But he is still inconsistent and high risk and oftentimes frustrating. But you can't be too frustrated at Pasternak because of how 
how much better he is than anyone else on this team in terms of actual skill and effectiveness and you know putting the puck in the back of the net which is the when you come when it comes down to it that's the most important thing in hockey and he does it better than most Brandon Carlo so the thing with Carlo is coming into this season I did have a lot of expectations for him I was really hoping that they would finally put him in a bigger role and by that I don't mean moving him up to the top pair or anything above McAvoy that would make no sense but just playing him against tougher competition finally giving him a chance to to shut down some of the top players in the NHL on a consistent basis, at least more often than he has over the past two or three years. Now that he's getting paid that long term, getting paid on that long term deal, in this season he's done exactly that. Carlo has been playing against some of the toughest, has getting been getting some of the toughest matchups in the league this season, and he is playing well. He's he's definitely exceeding my expectations. I I expected him to step up. He did that. I didn't actually think he would get these kind of matchups. He is really, really putting on a show. His offensive game has been a lot better too. He's actually, he's burying pucks now too. He's putting a lot more on the net. That's something I can never fault. And he had a he had a complete missile last night against the Penguins. And that kind of just, that just speaks, he's, it speaks volumes on his change of mindset in the offensive zone this year he's been a lot more comfortable holding the puck in the blue on the blue line and then making a decision with it rather than just throwing it down and you know he's been shooting more often and when he does good things happen I've been trying to yell at my at my tv for Carlo to shoot more often because for some reason everything good that can happen with this team happens when he takes a shot it's it's incredible Carlo's been great Derek Forbert, so he's only played 20 games this season. It feels like he's played less, to be honest, because of how in and out of the lineup he's been with with health problems. But when he has played, he's been about what I expected him to be. He's been, he's a third pair shutdown defender. He's good on the penalty kill. That's pretty much all we need out of him. I don't really need to go that much into detail. He's got four points in 20 games. He's been what's expected of him this year, and I can't complain. Matt Grizzlick. Matt Grizzlick has been one of the biggest disappointments I've seen with any player on the Boston Bruins over the past five years. This year, Grizzlick has completely taken a step back. He just turned 30. Today's his 30th birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. He's one of my favorite players. He might be, I'd say, leading into this season, he was my favorite player. But this year, it's been weird. Like, I still... I still love watching Matt Grizzlick play because I think he's such a talented skater and typically he's one of the top breakout passes in the league. You can look at the transition numbers. He was stellar. This year has been completely different. He's taken a, he's taken a total, like, I was going to call it a step back, but I, there's got to be a more excessive way to say it, but he, he's completely fallen off. His defensive play has been awful. His all his weaknesses along the boards, and yes, even before the season, he was he he did have problems in board battles, and he got exposed for that every now and then. But this season, he's getting exposed every shift, essentially, every shift. I'm I would consider myself one of the biggest Matt Grizzlick defenders over the past like three or four years that he's been an actual top four player. This year, there's been no excuses. Anyone who makes excuses for this player is just trying to trying to grasp onto something that isn't there. Grizzlick has been awful this season. He's been sheltered, and he's still been awful. It's some, I don't know if the injuries are catching up to him, but he has completely missed expectations. Completely. There were a lot of people that tried to criticize his play over the last few years, and yes, while I say it was declining, he never reached a point where you had to target him like he had been targeted by Bruins fans relentlessly last year and the year before and the year before that. Like, this year though, it's like essentially warranted now. He is playing terrible, and it is so disappointing because he's so talented, and I always thought he was a highly intelligent player, but this year it's like something just... Something has just been completely amiss, and he is on the verge of being sent down to Providence at this rate. He is playing terrible, and he really needs to start stepping it up if he wants to stay in this lineup and stay on this team at all. He might get traded in a cap dump at this point. $3.6 million for a for a guy who ran with Charlie McAvoy on the top pair and formed one of the most dynamic pairings in the league for over the past three years. 
for three point six million dollars, and he's going to be part of a cap dump. Like that is an incredible fall off. He's the easiest, easiest player to put in heavily falling short without question. Hampus Lindholm. Let's let's move on now. Hampus Lindholm, another left shot D, probably more ideal on that top pair with McAvoy. You know, unless you're going for lineup balance, but Hampus Lindholm this year. He's he hasn't been as good as he was last year. That is obvious. But so I will put him in moderately falling short, but I think it's just I think it's a very dense opinion to say that he's been heavily falling short because Hampus Lindholm before last year where he finished 4th in Norris voting, when he was with Anaheim, he was a great defender, right? Just like he is now. Even this season, he's been playing great hockey. But if you look at his point totals with Anaheim, he was a 20 to 30 point player on good teams. And that was not like way too early in his career. That was like around his prime, which right now he's like past that. He's past his prime right now, I'd say. Like last year felt like a bit of a late bloom, but to call Lindholm like a, a like a number one defender is just like you're looking too much into last season as like what he absolutely is. And last season he was just producing extremely well and playing terrific two-way hockey, but this year still feels like more Lindholm. He's a lot less risky this year, which honestly I liked about his game last year. It really made him stand out and was a big part of his uh of his offensive come up but he's still playing good two-way hockey. Like he's been there offensively he's helping the he's helping the team create offensive chances even if he's not you know one of the two or three touches on that chance but he's still playing well and his defensive game has been great as well I would just say that you know after last season you kind of would have hoped that he would still be producing as much but he's still playing great hockey he was just fourth in Norris voting last year so you would kind of hope he would be you know top 15 in or in Norris voting this year but the way he's producing that probably won't happen he's still playing good hockey yeah i'll keep him there but if i could put him in between this and this i would i'm definitely more on this side than this but I think it's just uh, consensus at this point that they expected a little bit more production out of Lindholm, who only has one goal in 37 games. Mason Lorai. So expectations should be low for, you know, a a rookie coming out of college. And although he's a rookie, he's turning 23 very soon. So to be honest, I did expect him to come in and at least play well enough to maintain a role on a bottom pair. But He's kind of been getting moved around from the bottom pair to the top pair with McAvoy, but at the same time he's being sheltered. There's a lot of line there's a lot of pair juggling when he's in the lineup so that he gets easier matchups. And in those easier matchups, I still don't think he's playing all that well. I I, th- I would say he's moderately falling short because I did expect him to be a little bit more consistent when he came into the league, and I thought his offensive game would shine through a little more because that's what he was in college. He had a deadly shot from the point. His skating is stellar, and it still is. Like he's He's been good in transition this year, but he loses the puck way too much in the defensive zone. He still needs to get a lot sharper with his decision-making. He's just not there yet. I, I've been advocating to send him back down to the minors, but while Matt Grizzlick is playing this terrible, I can see why you would want to see if Lorre can break through. I just don't think it'll happen. I think he needs more seasoning in the in the minors. Charlie McAvoy. So for McAvoy, I would say he's meeting expectations. McAvoy, he's been a horse for us every year. Last year, I think, was one of his biggest drop-offs out of nowhere. Like, it felt like last year, even though we were a 65 win team, he had to he had to kind of sacrifice a lot of his defensive efficiency to to be an offensive player, and that's what he is. To be honest, like he is he's a two way defender without a, without question. But McAvoy, he's such an offensively gifted player, and the biggest shock about his game is how he still can't put it together on the power play. He can't be a power play quarterback for this team. I'm not I'm not sure why. I think you just he's too he's too in love with maneuvering around in the offensive zone. And I mean deep in the offensive zone. He's a terrific skater and nobody wants to try and take the puck off this guy because he's so rangy and and fast and agile and his size kind of wards players off of him, but 
at the same time, it's not a bad idea to try and embrace a, a quarterbacking role on the power play. And that's why his power play numbers have been so terrible throughout his career. And I, I would say this year he's meeting expectations. He's not been the the monster that, you know, we've kind of come to see him as. You know, he's he's not playing in as difficult of, of matchups. I think Monty's been a lot more balanced with his matchups here to avoid tiring anyone out. And McAvoy hasn't really embraced that role of getting easier matchups. He's kind of played it safe. So I'm not entirely sure where I stand with McAvoy. I kind of wish he managed to stay in the pack of Makar and Fox and Haskinen and all those young, talented, two-way defenders. I think he's kind of fallen one tier below. But then again, he could very well be in a tier of his own below those guys because he is still an elite defender. And that's gonna, he's going to stay that way throughout the length of his contract. Kevin Shattenkirk, uh, I, I can confidently say he's meeting expectations. Last year with the Ducks, he was pretty much a bottom pair defender that could play special teams. He was pretty good on the penalty kill. What's been the biggest surprise this year with him is on the power play, he's been a complete horse. His, his puck moving on the power play has been a big part of Boston's success. During Boston's game against Pittsburgh last night, I did a lot of complaining and, and mostly praying and hoping that they would put him on the power play because every time he's on the power play, Boston immediately steps it up. I think it's to do. it has a lot to do with just how commanding he is on the blue line. Not in terms of skating or anything, but he just like... He picks a spot and he stays there. And he hovers around that spot and he just... He hits people up with these gorgeous saucer passes that just do wonders for this team. And I think that he's ex he's meeting expectations because of this. Because I can't say he's exceeding them because his 5-on-5 five -five play has honestly been a little bit worse than I thought. Like, he's getting sheltered a lot more than he did again with, uh, with the Ducks. But he's playing a... I'd say he's playing a pretty similar game. And that's just a part of age and decline. Like when you play easier roles, you know, you're not exactly going to get better when you're actively, you know, losing your legs. But I really like the role he's embraced on that power play. And I hope you keep giving him chances to, uh, to run that because as long as it's working, don't, you don't need to, you don't need to try and fix anything. The power play works when he's on it, put him on it. Jeremy Swayman, he's sitting Right by the top of the league in goal save above expected. He's up there in save percentage. Every goalie stat that you can think of, he's up there. The only one that he isn't that high in is games played because he's splitting that role 50-50 right now with Linus Allmark. But if I had to pick one of them and say that they are playing like the better of the two, I'd say Jeremy Swayman is currently the 1A. He's been terrific this season. Coming off of last game where he had a pretty bad start, it's it feels weird saying that just because of how frustrating the start of that game was, but that's Swayman's first real write-off of the season, as far as I can tell. He's had games where he hasn't been great, or he's had games where he's even been poor, but this is the first game where he's really hurt us, you know? Swayman has been a, an animal this season. He's exceeding expectations moderately. Uh, Swayman was incredible last season, but... I think the question was, if he could be a 1A, would he still play that good? And the answer right now is yes. So I will say it's moderately exceeding expectations. On to Linus Allmark, I would say he's meeting expectations. Because last season, coming off the Vesna win, I think it would be a little bit, a little bit wrong to say he had to repeat that. I, my expectations for him were that he could be still a great starting goaltender. And when he's, when he's starting in net, that's what he is. He's great. And if it weren't for Swayman, he would be playing a lot more games. And I, I'd imagine he would still be doing great. So I'd say he's meeting my expectations pretty firmly. Second last player, Patrick Brown. He's sitting dead even, I believe, at 10 games. With 10 games on the season, no goals, one assist, expectations for him were pretty much that he could be a depth forward who comes in and plays a solid defensive game. I would say he is meeting those expectations, but that's because expectations for him were low coming into the year. I think it would be disingenuous to say he's falling short, but I know Bruins fans have not enjoyed him being in the lineup. I am one of those Bruins fans, but... If you had expectations that this guy would be a lockdown mainstay fourth line center, then your expectations were too high. 
he's a player that's going to be in and out of the lineup throughout the year, and that's exactly what he has been. So I'd say he's meeting expectations. Last one here, Ian Mitchell. I would say he's meeting expectations in a way. He has been poor, I could say, but the expectations for him coming in were coming off of a year in Chicago where he was awful. He was terrible with the Blackhawks last year, one of the worst defenders in the league getting consistent minutes, and this year he's been fine. So I would even I would even move him up to exceeding expectations just because those expectations were so low for him. So I'm I'm pretty confident saying that He's been, you know, he's been a 7th, 8th defender. This, I would have expected him to be a consistent AHL player, but he's adapted pretty well, so I'll give him credit. But Ian Mitchell is still not a good player. He's he's hardly an NHL player, but I can say he's exceeding expectations just because I expected him to not even crack the lineup. But he's still managed to play 13 games, and yeah, he hasn't been a total colossal disaster and that's, you know, that's, I'll give him credit. You know, he was he was terrible in Chicago. He hasn't been nearly as terrible. So that's the end of the tier list. And, you know, I was thinking of adding Merkulov and all that, but they have not played enough games at all. I'm hoping to do one of these by the end of the season. Merkulov should have around 20 games by then, at least. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes. For predictions of players that I expect to jump or fall on this list... I'm going to say Coyle drops down to meeting expectations. I I just have a feeling he's going to keep up with the pace he's on, which is a negative pace. I think Patra will stay around there. I think DeBrusque is going to go up. I'm really hoping Mason Lorai goes up, if not sent down to the minors. I think Hampus Lindholm is going to go up. Production is... He's, de- he's due to start producing a little more. I'm hoping... I'm hoping that Matt Grizzlick and Brad Marchand both go up at least one tier. I'm very much hoping for that. I think the Bruins are going to need that kind of that kind of improved play from Grizzlick and Marchand because, you know, if the Bruins don't have their short kings, what do they have? In reality, the Bruins are just going to need these guys to start playing better because right now, I'm even though the Bruins are sitting right at the top of the standings, I'm not even sold on this team. We're not playing as good as our record would suggest, which kind of gives me the idea that a fall off is imminent and another losing skid is imminent and we're going to be a little less commanding throughout the rest of the year. And I think the Bruins should definitely look into adding to this roster because with our record right now, it's clear we will be in the playoffs. Why not commit and try to try to get a run with these players? But that's for another video or for another time. Thanks for watching. Um, I'll catch you whenever I upload again. So leave a like uh, or don't. Classic Eric just like completely forgetting one player. Thing is, I didn't forget Morgan Geeky in the sense that I didn't get his pictures. As you can see, there's two of him and one has a slightly larger head because ESPN is weird. That's besides the point. Point being, early in the video, I said something like, we'll get to Morgan Geeky, failing to realize that I didn't put his picture in the tier list. And I thought somebody was missing. So I'm going to quickly do Morgan Geeky after the video ends because I'm I'm terrible at this thing. So Geeky, I can safely put him in meeting expectations. Last year with Seattle, he was one of the, he was one of the better producers out of all fourth liners. I think... He produced at a rate, like, per 60 minutes of play, similar to, like, McDavid, which, you know, obviously what I'm saying here is that Geeky's as good as McDavid. But realistically, he produced very well in a fourth-line role, and that's because he's a talented offensive player, and he was getting played in a matchup system that was way too easy for him. The Bruins, they're giving him more of a chance to play a bit tougher competition. He's still getting sheltered pretty well, but... I think he's playing pretty well. He's a grinder, certainly a grinder, but I think coming out of of juniors, he was more of a, a goal scorer, if I remember correctly. With Carolina, that's what he was touted as. He was a goal scorer, and he can shoot the puck, and we saw that against Pittsburgh. He had a gorgeous goal off the uh, off the rush coming from the right side. 
but I'll credit Pasternak with the pass because it was nasty. Point being, Geeky, he's played well. Like, his def- defensive game is as poor as ever, but he that's, that's what I mean. He's meeting expectations. I kind of wish he was exceeding them, but he's meeting them, and the Bruins are sheltering him well enough to where he can play in a bigger role, but also not a role too big to where he's going to get He's going to get stoned and, and shut down by like some of the top defenders in the league every shift. He's meeting expectations. I honestly didn't even have to include him. I could have just said his name or something, but I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know how I forgot him. I had to save his photo twice, and I still forgot him. But he's there now, and so is his, his friend right here, and I'll put him there too. So this is the actual end of the video. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, hopefully I don't forget another player. If I did, I'm never going to forgive myself. Oh my god, I did forget another player. Oh my god, I don't know how this happens. Okay, Danton Heinen, last player. There's no chance that I forget another player, right? Heinen has been really, really helpful to the Bruins. Adding him off of uh, off of a PTO that he was on for like a month, like maybe even more. He was on that PTO for so long. And I had expectations for Heinen. I talked about him in a previous video when I went over the remaining UFAs in August. And Heinen was one of them. And one of the first things I said was that he should be signed right now. Heinen, last year, he had a very significant drop-off in his shooting percentage. And that really impacted his production. And production is what gets GMs interested, first and foremost. And because of that, Heinen didn't really go sign for a while. And... I think a lot of teams missed out. Heinen this year has been playing mostly on the third line, but he's actually gotten reps in the top six. Although, although even in the top six, he's not been getting like really you know consistent matchups with like top end guys. He's mostly just there as like a plug and play player, and that's all we can really ask for out of Heinen. He reminds me of JVR in that way. JVR has been a lot better this year, obviously, but just like the ability to get put into any spot in the lineup and to play well enough. Like, he's been playing on that third line with, I believe, Frederick and JVR over the past couple of games, and they've been fantastic together. And I can't complain about Heinen because of that. He's an incredible four-checker. Um, even, he does still lack a bit of edge, and he's not nearly as good along the boards and in battles, but um, I've, I've always liked his game, like... I can't say always, but I've liked his game since he left Boston for the first time. I was a big advocate to get rid of him back in 2020, I believe it was, when he was really, really having a poor season with the Bruins, and he wasn't moving the needle at all for this team. We got rid of him, and now he's back, and his game is improved, and he's more well-rounded and consistent, and I've loved his game. I'm going to say he's moderately exceeding expect expectations because I didn't think he would just come into the come back to the Bruins and just be like such a different player from when he was first with us. I could even say meeting cuz you know I had expectations for him. I thought he could be a good third liner. Like that's kind of what he was, but you know, he's been a great third liner. So I'll say he's moderately exceeding expectations. Okay, this is the actual end of the video. I can't I can't let this happen all the time like Jesus. Okay, so <laughs> yeah that's the end of it uh see ya